We still need to learn some music theory. Ooh. Yeah. Man, I love the enthusiasm. That's probably the warmest reaction music theory has ever gotten in like history. When I was nine years old, my parents enrolled me in piano lessons. And my teacher at the time tried her best to teach me not just how to play the piano, but also some music theory as well. And at the time, I was not into it. It was the same feeling I got when my parents told me I had to eat my vegetables. That's, that's the level we're talking here. And I think I can tell you a little bit why, why that might be. You see, at the time, I didn't feel a real connection to what I was learning. I could tell you, for example, what a plagal cadence was, but I couldn't tell you what it was good for or why anyone should care. Fast forward several years to high school, and I've developed a really strong, intense thirst for musical knowledge. And I start reading books, articles, Wikipedia pages, anything I can get, on my, get my hands on to learn more music theory. And something changed this time. I was learning about concepts like polyrhythms, polymeter, functional harmony, modes, and, um, and I started noticing these concepts in the world around me, in the music I was listening to, and just sounds in the world. It was like I was listening to the world with a completely new set of ears. My hope for today is that I can share some of that passion and some of that experience with some of you, and that maybe you'll walk away from today hearing the world a little bit differently as well. Let's get into it. There are three parts to this talk. First, we're going to talk about some music theory fundamentals to set the stage for part two, where I'll talk about the modes, what they are, and what they sound like. And finally, if we have some time at the end, we'll do a little listening game together. So, this is the circle of fifths. Probably the most important diagram in all of Western music theory. What you're looking at is the 12 notes, A through G, plus some sharps and flats, and they're arranged in a particular way. They're arranged so that any pair of notes on this wheel that's next to each other has the same interval of a fifth between them. It sounds a little like this. So all of those intervals are a fifth. Any two, any two spots on this wheel have that same relationship. The letters A, B, C, D, E, F, and G walk into a bar. The bartender says, I can't serve you. You're clearly A minor. <laughs> Thank you. One more joke. <laughs> I don't know how many jokes music theory has. <laughs> Any pair of notes on this wheel has the same interval relationship between each other. That's the first thing I want you to know about this diagram. And the second thing I want you to know is that when we go clockwise around the diagram, we get notes that sound brighter and brighter. It goes a little like this. Lovely. Like the sun's come out. When we go the other way, we get notes that sound darker and darker. It goes like this. Next, I want to talk about scales. Uh, what scales are at their core, they're a set of notes that you can arrange from lowest to highest, and they act as a set of creative constraints for a piece of music. So sort of like how a color palette is a, a set of constraints for a painting. It kind of helps to set the mood a little bit. There are two scales that you all are probably familiar with already. They're the major scale and the minor scale. Uh, just a refresher, they go like this. Major scale sounds like this. Do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. And the minor scale. Do, re, me, fa, sol, le, te, do. So generally speaking, how does the major scale sound? Just shout it out. Happy. Happy. And the minor scale generally sounds... Yeah. 
What is it about these scales, though, that make them sound happy and sad? To get something of an idea, we can go back to the circle of fifths. We can see how these scales overlay. <laughs> Remember that the clockwise side should sound brighter, counterclockwise should sound darker, and that's pretty much what we see with these two scales. We see the major scale has mostly bright notes in it, the minor scale has mostly dark notes in it. But having a model that can explain these two things is only the beginning. Ideally, what we want from this model is to be able to make new kinds of predictions. So the kinds of questions you might ask are, if the major scale is supposed to be bright, why does it still have one dark note in it? Could we make a scale that's even brighter than major? Could we make scales that are even darker than minor? And could we make anything between the two? For answers to these questions, we go to part two, <laughs> the modes. <laughs> The modes are a set, a family of scales that we can construct by taking that same pattern, that same layout on the circle of fifths, and rotating them clockwise and counterclockwise. So the major scale has seven different notes in it, and that means there are seven different possible modes. Three of them belong to the general major family, three belong to the minor family, and the last one, the odd one out, is diminished. So from lightest to darkest, they're Lydian, Ionian, Mixolydian, Dorian, Aeolian, Phrygian, and Locrian. I'm not going to say a lot about Locrian today. Uh, I've got plenty to talk about with the other six, but if you have questions, maybe raise them in Q&A. So starting off with the major three. Let's take a look at Ionian. Uh, this is actually just another name for the major scale. Same notes, same pattern. But we're going to use this as an a anchor point to compare how the other scales sound. So moving on from Ionian, if we rotate all the notes clockwise space, we get a mode called Lydian. It's a little bit brighter than major. It's got a raised fourth degree in it, so it sounds like this. Do, re, mi, fi, sol, la, ti, do. That raised fourth is the only note that's different, so it's the one that gives it its characteristic Lydian-ness. Uh, generally, my impression of, of music that's written in Lydian, it tends to sound brighter, it sounds triumphant, uh, sometimes playful even. But I think the, the best way to understand this mode is through an example. So we go to <laughs> The Simpsons. In, in a second, I'm going to play The Simpsons theme for you. And I want you to really focus on that raised fourth sound and take note of how it makes you feel. Before we do that, though, I, I know I probably lost some of you at listen to the raised fourth sound. What does that even mean? Uh, maybe I might as well have told you Pay attention to how your pancreas feels right now. Yeah. <laughs> little, little abstract. Um, don't panic. The, uh, knowing how a note fits into the scale, it's not an innate ability that you have to have been born with, and it's not the kind of thing that you have to have been like a child prodigy or something to figure out. This is a skill that you can learn. And uh, to get a taste of it, I'm going to play for you the Simpsons theme, as it is in Lydian, back to back with what it would sound like in regular old major. So that's the theme. <laughs> A little off. Yeah. yeah. So that note, the ones that are different in the second one, those are the notes I want you to pay attention to. So without further ado, The Simpsons. Okay. That was the Lydian mode. Moving on, we're going to go next to a mode a little bit darker than major, called Mixolydian. So compared to the major scale, this has a flat 7 in it. it sounds like this. Do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, te, do. 
that seventh degree makes the scale sound a little more chill. A little spacey, maybe a little bluesy. Our example comes from Star Trek. <laughs> this is a theme from Star Trek The Next Generation. And again, I'm going to play it for you the regular way, followed by plain old major. This is going to go by a little bit faster, so listen carefully. themes are a really interesting kind of case study because they have to summarize a show before you even see it. They, they need to capture the emotions of that show and convey it musically. Um, I think the Mixolydian mode is a real part of what makes Star Trek sound like Star Trek. We covered all the major modes. Quick recap. Lydian, bright and happy like Simpsons. Mixolydian, a little bit more chill. <laughs> we'll go next to the minor modes. Here, these are Do Dorian, Alien, and Phrygian. So like last time, I want to start in the middle. I'm going to start with Alien because this is just another name for plain old minor. You know how it sounds. We'll compare the other scales to Alien, though. If we turn the wheel clockwise, we go a little bit brighter, and we get a new mode called Dorian. Dorian has a raised sixth in it compared to Alien. It sounds like this. Do, re, me, fa, so, la, te, do. That raised sixth sound, to me, is the sound of fantasy. It's the sound of Game of Thrones, or Lord of the Rings, or Dragon's Crown, any of these things. It gets used in other contexts as well, for sure. You'll also hear Dorian sometimes in rock music or jazz, but that to me is the strongest association I have. And I have an example for you. It comes from Lord of the Rings, Return of the King. Um, this is from a scene where Pippin, one of the hobbits, uh, he got suckered into being a servant to Denethor. This real nasty guy. Uh, and he has to sing a song for his entertainment. Meanwhile, what's also happening in this scene is that his friends are off in battle, probably getting killed. So it's a really emotional part of the film. And I think the Dorian mode part is uh, in part what can, helps convey that emotion. So you know the rule by now. Dorian first, and then we'll listen to the regular Meyer next. sound like Lord of the Rings. It's what makes it sound more heartfelt, but also makes it sound a little more antiquated, so. Miss behind the world ahead And there are many paths to tread Through shadow to the edge of Till the stars are all alive. Okay, that was Dorian. One more mode. A little bit darker than minor is a new mode called Phrygian. This compared to minor has a flat two in it. That sounds like this. Do, ra, me, fa, sol, le, te, do. 
That flat two sound, it's pretty dark. <laughs> to me it sounds kind of stormy, it sounds also like Egypt, maybe? I don't know. <laughs> uh, I've never been to Egypt and I don't know if they use the, the Caribbean mode in their songs, but I will tell you that Film composers absolutely use this mummy to be in Egypt. <laughs> Notice it next time you watch The Mummy or something, right? Uh, also sounds like flamenco, and, and that is uh, not a coincidence. That is actually because it's used a lot in flamenco music. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> an example of Phrygian mode I have for you comes from the classic video game Chrono Trigger. This is a game about adventures through time. Um, and in this particular moment in the game, you and your friends have gone back in time to fight a wizard because you have to prevent the apocalypse. It's a really kind of tense and dramatic moment in the game, and I think the use of the Phrygian mode uh, does a lot to really sell that. version of this sounds just so bland to me because it's, it's really just a walk down the scale for most of the song, but uh, that Phrygian flat too adds a little extra spice to it, so I think it's still a really cool composition, uh, a really cool moment in the video game. <laughs> Recap. Dorian is the sound of fantasy. Phrygian is, I don't know, maybe it's Egypt or something. <laughs> you decide for yourselves. We're now ready for part three. I'm going to play for you a little clip, and uh, I want you to listen for those, those colorful notes. That sharp four in Lydian, or that flat seven. Uh, the, the raised six or a flat two. Um, and I know at this point, especially if this is your first time doing such a thing, it's definitely going to be kind of hard to pick out those notes. But a, a good compass, a good thing to sort of guide your ear is to, to really cue into the emotions. You know, is this sound triumphant? Is it the Lydian sound because it's extra bright? Is it extra dark? Could it be Phrygian? So that's what I want you to be listening for. Back to the future. on the left, you got multiple choice, uh, and I'll tell you, it's not Locrian because we didn't talk about it. It's also not Aeolian or Aeolian, or Ionian because those are boring. <laughs> <laughs> Can I get a show of hands? Who thinks it's Lydian? Got some guesses. Anyone for Mixolydian? Yeah. Uh, Dorian? Yeah. And Phrygian. Alright, so the Lydians have it. Yeah. <laughs> I got, got a couple more. This one comes from Super Smash Brothers. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. 
Last one. <laughs> this, is, this is the iPhone timer shot. <laughs> This is my subliminal messaging campaign. Anytime someone's timer goes off, you're gonna think about modes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, votes for Lydian. Okay, mixed Lydian. Yeah, got some. Uh, Dorian. Or Phrygian. Go with Phrygian. All right, mixed Lydian it is. How's that? You filmed to the end. Thank you all for playing and thanks for listening. Is this on? Is Joe? Is the mic on? Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Great, mic's on. Uh, so we. Uh, so let's have some quick questions. Let's have some quick answers. Who's got the first one? Louis, you've already answered something, haven't you? But no one else has a question. Okay, Lewis. <laughs> Favorite musical theme from a film? Favorite musical theme from a film? Uh, Jurassic Park, yo. <laughs> <laughs> Jurassic Park, by the way. Lydian mode, listen for it. <laughs> I could do this all night. Uh, so, like the big guys, you know, the Dr. Dre, all, all those big producers, do they go into this stuff and they produce music? Hmm. Uh, I'm not sure I can speak to anybody, uh, anybody's individual decisions. Uh, I know for a fact, like, film composers in particular definitely gravitate strongly towards modes as, as a way to set the tone. Um, so, for example, um, John Williams loves Lydian, makes a, a really sort of uplifting, kind of happy family fun kind of movie soundtracks. Um, you know, it, are these things that everybody's thinking about? I don't know. I think it could be that, that some people sort of subconsciously gravitate towards things without knowing it. And I think there are definitely some other songwriters and composers that very intentionally pick out what modes they're going to use. You mentioned that you're approaching this from a Western music theory standpoint, right? Yeah. Uh, would you say like there's a similar concept of scales in like other traditions of music? Hmm. Uh, there absolutely are. There are um, throughout the world lots of different tuning systems that people use, and uh, many of them have the same sort of concept where they have some sort of mother scales, and then uh, modes and different um, usages of those scales that they'll, they'll um, sort of build off of that. Um, I know in Japanese music, there are uh, a few different kinds of pentatonic scales, uh, scales with just five notes in them, uh, that tend to get used, and uh, they have their own theory about them. They have their own different sort of modes of those scales. So um, I was just waiting. <clears throat> so I was wondering with these different feelings and associations, like you're saying these film composers are using them intentionally. Yeah. So I was wondering, sort of, maybe it's a chicken and egg sort of situation, right? Like, is it that these have some inherent feeling and they're drawing on that and using that, or have we collectively built up this connotation as a society of the audience? Because you know. Ah, oh, I heard that from Jurassic Park, so it has the same feeling as my sister. Yeah. You know, I think it's, it's really hard to separate those kinds of uh, concerns, right? That, on the one hand, we do have this model, this um, circle of fifths, that is a pretty good explanation for why we think Lydian sounds right. Uh, but there's absolutely always going to be sort of prior biases that people bring with them, right? So. There may be uh, people on the other side of the world who have absolutely no idea why I think Phrygian sounds like Egypt, um, but for me it does, and it probably always will. So uh, 
you know, that's definitely one of those associations that people can use intentionally. Um, whereas other sorts of things, like the, the general brightness or darkness of the scale, I think is a little bit more innate to the actual music itself. I have a question. What's on your shirt? Oh, <laughs> that's a really cool question. OK, uh, so this is a little phrase that um, is called the lick. Um, and it gets used a lot uh, in jazz music. You'll hear people, dif uh, different yeah. soloists, use this in part of, parts of their solo. And uh, recite it for us? I, should, I should actually do that, yeah. So it, it sounds like this. It sounds like do 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 do. It is. It's actually um, potentially Dorian. There's no uh, there's no six degree to, to uh, contradict us on that. But. Uh, I'm curious about uh, the real life application for those series. Something like like Brian Eno you know, and being music and all things. Hmm. Is there anything like that? Um, as far as real life applications go, I would say now that you know these exist. Listen for them in music that you're that you're um, I don't know listening to right. Uh, these get used all over the place, really. Um, Dorian, in particular, I think uh, it's got a, a really pretty easy characteristic to sort of wrap your ears around. So, if um, if this kind of thing is interesting to you, that would be my challenge to you: is next time you see whatever it is, Game of Thrones or some fantasy movie or something, challenge yourself to see if you can't. Figure out when they're using the Dorian mode, because chances are they are. Um, but outside of like film music or, or um, game music, right? Um, these get used in plenty of other genres as well. Um, here's a, a good example. If you all know, let's see. Um, gosh, what is that song called? It's by uh, Lord. It's like Royals. That's the one. Yeah, that's Mixolydian. So these get used in popular music, right? They get used in uh, blues and rock and roll in pop, everywhere. Can I Sorry, we need to get one last question, and then you can ask him while we're cleaning up. Hello. I was very impressed by your pitch <laughs> and your <laughs> ability to recall every single scale by memory. Yeah, thanks. Um, was that something that was required of you in your musical training to memorize like, did you practice that on an instrument, or were you required to actually hum them to yourself? How long did that take you to learn? Hmm. Um, so, throughout my musical career, there have been various times where people have really encouraged me to do some ear training, which is the, the kind of skill that you need to, to be able to sing these kinds of things. And um, most of the time, I either kind of half-assed it or didn't, um, until actually pretty recently, like a year ago, and I decided, you know, this is a, a musical skill that I want to have. And so I went out of my way to, you know, learn what all of these sound like and be able to produce them. So. It can be done. It, is, it's, um, it, it seems like when you don't have that skill, like, oh, I could never get there. That, they, they must have spent years and years and years to develop that. Um, realistically, I think only a couple of months, right? This is. Uh, Something that I put some effort into gradually over, over several days, but um, it's not the, I don't know, kind of intense study that I was doing in like college or anything. Okay, and with that question and answer complete, let's thank all of our speakers, not just